And, and so why, why don't we um, quickly go through um, some introductions on the panel and then we can start uh, chatting a bit. So, um, uh, Amita, uh, we, we know you, we know you well. Thanks for the introduction during your video. Um, Madhu, would you like to um, introduce yourself and, and talk a little bit about, you know, uh, your role within PSTC and what you've been doing? You're on mute, Madhu. Still on mute. Oh, there you go. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation to be to sort of uh, be a part of this panel and just this, this kick off day of the senior celebration. I mean, um, the amount that I learned today has been absolutely tremendous, and uh, I, I look forward to um, continuing to be a part of this. Um, and so. As a brief introduction, uh, my name is Bandar Lal Nag. I am the uh, design of the drug, um, uh, of the drug within the Office of Computational Sciences. Um, have been at the SA only for about two and a half years now. I was at the NIT for nine years before that. Uh, trained as a molecular oncologist, but obviously have spent so much in that years developing physiological development models, uh, more from an efficacy perspective, especially as it pertains to um, oncology and uh, rare diseases. And then I've been to the FDA and have um, uh, you know, been talking uh, uh, for at length now with Amita and John Michael about really incorporating that regulatory perspective into the development of this, this platform, if you will, of, of alternative models for testing safety uh, and efficacy and to sort of break down the silos between them. So, um, Excited to be a part of this um, this whole endeavor, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, hearing everyone's perspective. Thank you. To uh, turn up your microphone. I'm sorry, Madhu. Thank you very much. If your audio is a little bit soft. You may want to turn up your microphone when you're uh, participating in the panel. So. Thank you. Stefan, would you like to uh, introduce yourself and your uh, your interest within PSTC and other activities? Hi, John Michael. Hi. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Stefan Sultana. Um, I'm currently working uh, with AstraZeneca within the patient safety organization. And within that organization, I actually have uh, a renal organ toxicity uh, consultant role. Um, I've been with PSTC now since 2008 probably, which which makes it about 13 odd years, and in three different companies, I've always managed to stay part of PSTC. So that that's that's good news. Um, I've been part of the the kidney safety uh, group uh, within PSTC um, from the early days when we had the uh, the, the the preclinical qualification, and I was part of the team that designed the two prospective patient studies as well as looked at the the data from the healthy volunteer study and from the retrospective uh, cisplatin study which made up the composite panel which is the 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 qualified biomarker panel that amita referred to which fda qualified in 2018 um yeah uh, so that's about me Great, thanks, Stefan. Um, Tanya, would you like to introduce yourself? Internal Global Safety Biomarker Effort. I have been part of PSGC also since 2008, Stefan, and uh, have kind of increased uh, my roles also externally in TransBioLine, uh, as well as part of the, the safety effort uh, at that time. I work uh, on the skeletal muscle and the vascular injury uh, working groups in particular, but uh, have a broad interest across the organ working groups. Thank you. Thanks, Tanya. Uh, Deidre, do you want to introduce yourself to the group? Oh, sure. Hi, Deidre Dolmas from GlaxoSmithKline. I'm in uh, the investigative safety group. I've been involved in PSTC, I would say, probably perhaps since around 2010, specifically. Uh, generally in the drug-induced vascular injury working group, 
And currently I'm one of the co-chairs with Tanya on, on that working group. And, um, you know, we have a great, I would say, collaboration between all the different individuals within that group and, you know, participate and have a broad interest, you know, across all of the different areas, um, you know, through involvement of GSK on the various different panels as well with PSCC and also, I would say, participating in some of the efforts um, uh, I would say getting PSTC for non trans bioline members involved somehow behind the scenes. I, I would say with with trans bioline and being able to hopefully share some of that data, you know, through those collaborative efforts, as well as, uh, you know, as Anita mentioned in, you know, some of her talk is participating in, in those advisory council meetings, those monthly meetings and uh, sharing all of that information and helping to try to, you know, provide insight as we move forward with uh, PSTC for uh, biomarker development. Great, thanks Deidre, appreciate that. So we, we actually have uh, an initial question uh, from the uh, audience that I'll go ahead and, and read out to the panel. You guys can also look at that in the uh, Q&A box. But uh, the question is, uh, what uh, exactly does a letter of support mean for a biomarker to a pharma, pharma company currently performing a drug safety test? Are there, uh, uh, are there ranks of significance or strength of the letter? Um, uh, is use of the biomarker uh, even more than a suggestion from PSTC. So I, I can start with that, and I think maybe we can have a little bit of a conversation around it as a group. You know, there, there's no doubt that a, a letter of support does not hold the strength that a qualified biomarker does. But what it does do is it allows a company to realize that a biomarker has been recognized by the health authority. What we have done um, as PSTC is we've also provided data packages that we presented to the agency to receive that letter of support that more or less shows the strength and potential weaknesses of that biomarker. What our hope is that companies would, you know, take these uh, ex more exploratory biomarkers, you know, forward for use into studies when appropriate and then actually share that data with the community if possible, right? So that we all learn from that. And so that, that's really the idea of, of the letter of support in my mind is to be able to give, you know, drug development investigators, safety scientists, um, at least a document that shows the fact that the health authorities are aware of this. And uh, I, I think the way, you know, Chavre Buckman put it is to shine a bright light um, on the the potential use of these biomarkers. A any other thoughts from the panel around the letter of support? So, John that's Michael, that's this is Yuri. Oh, oh, go ahead. Go, 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 no, ahead, no, no. go ahead, Tanya. Go ahead. Sorry, I was going to say that's our personal experience internally as well. That. Um, having some foundational knowledge around that biomarker is very, very useful, even if you're going to use it outside the context of where the letter of support was placed. But teams also uh, feel that there is um, some weight to that biomarker, that it wasn't just kind of picked out of the thin air, especially when it's used for safety purposes. Um, so I think it helps provide a weight of evidence that teams should really consider that, um, especially if there's a need for that on their team. Yeah, and and I would follow on 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 Tanya. Uh, you know, what, for uh, what it signifies is a certain level of a scientific consensus on 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 the biomarker, and level of uh, of review with the and that people really look through the data, and uh, um, because as the members uh, um, got access to all the all, all the underlying data. Then um, uh, the importance for the company is to, if they need to use the biomarker, if they have a need for it, even outside of it, they can use the information to formulate their argument for accepted use under the IND. And, and that's an absolute invaluable uh, um, information which uh, um, you know, that, that um, sponsor has. Yeah, and I, I agree. The other thing, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. 
No, I was going to say, I think the other thing it does is you can also tell the clinicians, uh, you know, we've, we've looked at 10 or 20 other biomarkers and they didn't carry um, the compelling evidence to move forward into this letter of support. So you also help remove potential biomarkers that teams might be thinking of, or at least suggest that those have been looked at and these, you know, three have moved forward for this reason. And so you also help the teams triage, you know, what can be a, a really an abundance of possibilities. And I'm sorry, Deidre, go ahead. Yeah, so sorry. And I mean, in line with what you were just saying, I, you know, do think, and I agree with what you're saying is that the information that's not in that letter that we're aware of that we've seen all that data for really does provide that, you know, extra information because, you know, there's so many different teams that are, you know, developing different molecules and they'll come up and they'll say, okay, we see this injury. They pull information from literature and we have that insight based off of PST to see to say, yeah, we've looked at that and yeah, that's not, you know, going, but, you know, here's, here's this one or here's this two or, you know, the panel, whatever getting put forward. And, you know, we've, we've really looked at that and this one has that, you know, really advanced um, data behind it. And um, with that letter, I would say that does provide a, a wit, like a lot of weight of evidence to, even though it's not qualified yet to, to say, you know, something very uh, much interest. Um, for teams and, you know, with, with all that involvement from all those companies and all the expertise and really looking at that data, like Yuri said. Well, thanks everybody. I think that was really helpful to understand, you know, how that's being used. I don't know, Stefan, do you want to comment quickly? You're the only industry member that hasn't commented yet on the letter of support. Okay. Um, so I would totally agree with everything that has been said so far. The only thing I would add to the discussion is perhaps as we're putting together letters of support data packages for regulatory agencies, it might be useful for us to think about how best to communicate that wealth of information in some sort of package that individual companies can then access via the website. Because actually what probably stops people from using uh, biomarkers which have an LOS um, uh, status, if you like, is that they, they don't quite know how to use them. They don't know what the rules are, what the limitations are. Now, I know that these LOS biomarkers often have quite uh, poor information compared to a qualified biomarker, but I think some of those aspects would be really important, like what are the normal range, what's the expected normal range in, in a healthy population, what's the expected uh, movement uh, with injury, what threshold should you be using, or do we even not know this level of information at all? I think that's the only thing I'd add is we should think about what information we should put out there to encourage people to use yep. these these biomarkers, at least in the clinic, definitely. And sorry, yeah, maybe so one more comment that just was recently uh, brought to our attention is um, it may form networks. So people see a successful letter of support and they want to work in that area. And so recently someone reached out and said, hey, we were told your um, submission was one of the strongest they've seen. Can we learn from that submission? And so it could also help broaden the industry uh, expertise, uh, also to academic institutions. Yeah, those those are all great points. So, Stefan, you know, we, we do have uh, the in some information that is on the website. Again, in many cases, if you look at our letters of support so far, they're primarily um, from uh, non-clinical, although GLDH was was uh, a clinical letter of support where there is, you know, basically that abstracted information that we we um, supplied to the regulators uh, around the performance of the biomarker within those data packages. So, but, but I agree with you. We have to figure out the best way to share this information um, that we can. And I think maybe the webinars is also a way to, to actually do that. Well, actually, that's that's really good timing, actually. Somebody just flipped the slide there for me. So, you know, one thing I'd like to do before we jump into the, 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 the webinars and, and talking a little bit about these, I would like to, to have Madhu and, and Amita, you know, also speak to us a little bit about the importance of PSTC to health authorities and, and really how you see that, that health authorities can leverage 
you know, groups like PSTC. I know, Amita, you went into that a bit in your talk, but if you can emphasize some of the high points, I, I think that would be great. And then, Madhu, if you could uh, add to that, that would be really helpful. Madhu, do you want to? Can you hear me, John Michael? Yes, we, we can hear you fine, Amita. Great. Um, so, Madhu, if you want to go first, because I think people are probably tired of looking at me and listening to me. I had such a long talk. I'm sorry, guys, but I couldn't stop talking when it comes to my experience with PSTC. So, Madhu, please go ahead. Thank you, Amita. And it was an incredible talk, by the way. Um, uh, so I'm just going to actually uh, jump off of some of the notes that I took while you were talking, because, you know, um, to, to address what you asked, John Michael, um, the PSTC is it, it sort of provides for us this area where we can interact with industry and academia in, a, in the pre-competitive space. Um, you know, primarily just in terms of the way that our research is set up um, within CEDAR and, and, and some other centers. Um, you know, we don't have this ability to understand the scientific value of knowledge. And, you know, the previous conversation about the LOS sort of alluded to that, you know, what does an LOS provide? It provides the weight of multiple, multiple people looking at the same biomarker and opining on it, especially in the cases of rare diseases where we're looking at efficacy, where we're looking at safety and don't have access to that sort of research within, uh, within the FDA. Having regulators and scientists and industry in the same space as part of the same consortia really provides that backing to us in areas that we are unable to do research ourselves, but really want to move the needle. And I think, um, you know, speaking um, in, in in sort of emerging areas and alternative uh, models of testing, um, this is this is going to be a big a big area for where, where where CEDAR can actually really benefit from interacting um, in in consortia like this. Thanks, Madhu. Um, Amita, we're not bored with you. Can you give uh, your perspective? Yeah, de definitely. Thanks, uh, Madhu, and thanks, John Michael. So let me just add a couple things um, regarding what is it that we rely on uh, PPPs or uh, an organization such as PSTC for. And let me give you two specific examples. And these are the things that have been under discussion in the PSTC working group meetings on an ongoing basis. One of them relates to why is Madhu here? And the reason I turned to Madhu is because of her expertise over the years related to in vitro systems. And something that Yuri mentioned was, we won't develop a biomarker if it's not useful. So using that line, we wouldn't develop in vitro systems if they are not useful. And that's where we pulled in Madhu, we pulled in a, several other people. Uh, we, 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 as in PSTC, is reaching out to other consortia. Utility of in vitro systems in lieu of animal studies, utility of in vitro systems as predictive tools, and I think this is the area of immense interest in all of the scientific community, right? The toxicologists and uh, regulators uh, across the board. Uh, it's interesting. I was in a sem. I, I was giving a talk to young students. These were high school students one time, and one student asked me at the end, "Can FDA do without animal studies?" Can they do without all the animal tests? I mean, this is the direction that these youngsters are thinking. And we have ongoing researcher research in uh, in vitro systems. And we have a white paper from the FDA from the toxicology group. Uh, how can you, you know, do uh, minimize uh, uh, animal testing? 
that's where we pulled in Madhu and the microphysiological systems and, and many, many more such in vitro tools as predictive uh, methodologies. Uh, so, so that's one aspect that we are turning to PSTC. And John Michael, you very nicely stated that PSTC is expanding into things beyond just qualification. It could be fit for purpose or many other things. I don't know. The second thing that I want to uh, give, an the second example that I want to share, and I know there will be uh, webinars for both the in vitro tools as well as this other thing that I'm mentioning, uh, the, the whole aspect that Dr. Lisa Thompson uh, raised at some of our recent meetings uh, with the CPATH internally, basically using um, a cascade, a, a, a toolkit rather than one set, a one, one slice of the puzzle, right? Uh, biomarkers is one piece and then there are many other aspects that can be uh, linked together to create a predictive tool. The bottom line being, can you predict drug-induced kidney injury? Can you use all of these tools together, interlinked, find out where the missing pieces are, and can someone help with filling that missing piece? And can we use this tool that is then developed quantitatively to, to make some predictions for the patient. So the bottom line being the patient. So uh, I'm bringing in the second example as, you know, the other extreme being totally clinical prediction of the patient. So, so again, we are turning to PSTC and I know John Michael uh, Madhu, you all will be covering this in the webinars. Thanks, Amita. I think that was really helpful. Yeah, and then I think sometimes what happens as um, you know, when, when we concentrate purely on the biomarker, what do we what do we concentrate on the biomarker? We forget that it's not the be all end all. Instead, it's just another piece of data. We want to make sure it's a good piece of data, right? That's why we're spending all the time on it. But it has to then be, you know, interact. It has to interact with all the other data pieces. So, so what I'd like to do next is just spend a little bit of time on the on the webinar series, just to talk about that in a little bit more depth than we have. And, and so on, on May 26th is our, our first webinar, and that's gonna be on the clinical uh, kidney safety biomarker composite measure. Um, it's gonna include a, a couple folks, including Stefan. Stefan, would you like to add, uh, would you like to, Kind of add some color to uh, this webinar, just so folks know what they're they're getting themselves into. If indeed they tune in, sure thing. Uh, so, so the current plan is to have Elisa Thompson from FDA, myself, and Gary Friedman from Pfizer um, giving a webinar um, focused mo mainly on on the clinical. Uh, Kidney Safety Biomarker Panel, which has recently been qualified by FDA for use in phase one normal healthy volunteer studies. Elisa will give us some regulatory insights as to the need and the regulatory environment for developing kidney safety biomarkers and perhaps providing some color as to how companies are currently using these biomarker tool sets, um, whether it's within, within the intended use or perhaps extending a little bit beyond the intended use into case by case basis as well. I'll give an overview of the, the composite measure, which is the application of that safety biomarker in phase one healthy volunteer studies. And myself and two others will, will give you a few examples of how we've used these biomarkers in phase one programs in our companies. And then Gary will round us off with where these biomarkers are going next, which is the kidney uh, safety panel, which will, will be applied uh, in patient studies, phase two, phase three studies, um, once we, 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 we analyze the data from the two prospective patient studies. Thanks, Stefan. And back to you. Thanks, Stefan. I mean, that, that was a great summary, and I think it's 
going to be a really interesting uh, webinar, especially the fact that these biomarkers are being applied. I think folks are going to be really interested in, in seeing how that's playing out because I, I think, you know, the qualification is one step, but then the actual implementation, that's another step. And I think we're, we're all going to learn together there. So, so, so thanks for uh, being a part of that. Hey, any questions for Stefan? If, if not, what I'll do is just really quickly uh, introduce the July 28th uh, alternative solutions uh, and safety assessment uh, webinar. This one's still uh, under formation, right? As far as exactly um, the speakers and where we're, we're going to go. But we, we know we're going to go a couple interesting places. You know, one is going to be about looking at, you know, future approaches. Um, and biomarkers that, that, that can be brought uh, into qualification or into use in drug development. Uh, and another one is going to be around the use of these complex in vitro systems and how, you know, these MPS or, or other systems actually fit into regulatory decision making. You know, one of the things that we've been thinking about is how do we utilize the uh, in vivo biomarkers is really translational vehicles for better utilizing these tools. That could be extremely interesting. That really hasn't been tried, you know, previously. And will that make these tools, you know, more translatable, as I said? Um, likewise, there's been some really nice work that, that really came out of an early work group within PSTC around uh, carcinogenicity and, and, and the, the, the using genomic pathways to basically limit um, the uh, 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 size and, and, and time frame of uh, carcinogenicity studies uh, for, for uh, seeking uh, marketing authorization. And so those are some of the ideas. But, you know, I'll, I'll open it up to you um, if you want to add in any additional uh, insight into this, uh, the, the, this uh, webinar. Thank you, John Michael. Um, yes, thank you for the opportunity. Um, uh, and I wanted to expand upon something that you and Amita have talked about, and then um, Tanya has also uh, uh, sort of um, uh, focused on uh, with respect to this idea of open science um, and how important it is for us within the consortia to to really push that. So the first the first sort of idea I would like to talk about or bring attention to honestly is that um, uh, the definition of a microphysiological model as as defined by the FDA, um, it is it encompasses any sort of multicellular complex in vitro model that that uh, recapitulates disease pathology. In fact, different aspects of disease pathology, if you will, so that you know you build in complexity to answer a particular question about drug efficacy and safety. But in terms of looking at evaluation or evaluating systems, we've consistently been focusing on organ on a chip and tissue on a chip systems, because this is sort of the question that comes to us from industry in terms of what, what do you evaluate? What is, what will you accept as validation? But I want to, I want to bring up again to this group here today that microphysiological systems is a huge continuum, you know, and, and being able to talk about this, being able to share data that comes from different microphysiological systems, whether you're talking about spheroid systems, iPSC-derived organoids, uh, multicellular systems, or then sort of tissue on a chip systems, these all form very um, important aspects of predictive models for us for both efficacy and safety. And um, I think um, I'm looking forward to this webinar being one of those platforms where we can really discuss the entire continuum of complex in vitro models, both in terms of providing non-clinical endpoints for us for safety and efficacy, uh, but also in terms of, um, as Amita had mentioned too, are we getting to a point where we are looking to replace certain in vivo models, especially in the area of rare diseases, or are we trying to get to a point, for example, a lot of uh, oncology studies where we can increase throughput, but get to 
be at least as predictive as sort of the standard of care right now. So um, that, that was sort of one of the first things that I wanted to bring up. And the second sort of alludes to or brings in aspects of another webinar that BSTC is organizing in November, I believe, on, on data sharing. And this goes back to that idea of open science. There's a lot of uh, trepidation about protecting proprietary um, uh, data, and, and rightfully so. But I, I think uh, truly that if uh, the regulators continue to play in their regulatory siloed space and, and industry is, is sort of doing early research and development and, and never can the two crossover, you know, we'll still sort of be functioning with this huge delta in, in drug development science. And, and Dr. Woodcock very rightly puts this, um, you know, it's not regulatory science, it's not translational science, it's not applied research, it's all part of drug development science. And um, um, I'm, I'm really excited to see what the series of seminars by PSTC sort of speaks to that concept of drug development science, with all the stakeholders at the table. So, yeah. Great. Thank you very much, Madhu. And, and Tanya, you know, would you like to give a few words around the, the September webinar looking at uh, the role of safety biomarkers as disease biomarkers? Sure. And you're, you're welcome to jump in as well. And I know we'll probably expand that group as well. But the initial thought is, uh, you know, in several instances where we need to qualify biomarkers as safety biomarkers, we simply don't have the clinical adverse events needed to do so because usually they're unacceptable AEs and so it never moves out of the non-clinical space. So these are things like neurotoxicity, vascular toxicity, where currently they're poorly monitorable. So um, we basically can't really have enough patients to qualify uh, those biomarkers. So the idea is to, based on shared pathophysiology, to um, validate a safety biomarker using a disease cohort uh, population. And in doing so, it's become quite evident that these same end organ based biomarkers, if they share the pathophysiology with disease states, can also be diagnostic, prognostic, or, you know, response biomarkers. And so we, we will hope to provide some examples of that and see if we can broaden that perspective because it then immediately broadens the use for these biomarkers. Um, and maybe potentially they become our next standard labs for use in, in many scenarios. So you're, I'll let you uh, speak if you'd like a little bit more. Or... Uh, Tanya, uh, this is, uh, you said it absolutely nicely. Uh, th this is uh, one area which, you know, you and I share a, a huge interest into moving biomarkers into different, uh, from safety to diagnosis of disease to, you know, efficacy side, because as, for somebody it's a safety, for somebody it's efficacy, right? So it's 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 all about how, how you do them and how we actually bring them to clinical care at the end. As I talked about this kind of a, first the safety biomarkers were developed as a biomarkers of disease, then we started using them in drug development. But now, since we're developing biomarkers for drug development, well, oh, they actually have a potential in in in, in disease and, and clinical care. So closing that loop, I think it's 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 uh, at least to me absolutely exciting, and I'm I'm delighted to be involved in this. Yeah, definitely. It's been very exciting to see how within within several of our working groups, we've we've begun incorporating that into our qualification plans and utilizing patients with with diseases that present with similar types of injury to, to uh, a drug induced injury and how, how we can apply those to learn um, at, uh, the, the range and, and uh, the, the range of, the, of, of, uh, of how the biomarkers perform. So thank you both. And, and so looking at the, the November workshop, this is gonna be talking about data sharing and, and, um, and how you know the, the, the advancing biomarkers and drug development is is uh, and data sharing is is key to advancing these biomarkers since a lot of this work is done in a collaborative and pre-competitive space. Um, sharing of this data is key. So Deidre, if you'd like to provide just a little bit of a summary of what's being proposed for that webinar. Oh, I think you're still on mute, Deidre. Sorry about that. Um, so yeah. So yeah. Um, just I want to say it was last week. Uh, you know, PSTC sponsored a uh, SOT uh, workshop that did focus on this. So this is really a, a continuation of that. We had, you know, a lot of great speakers from across industry and the academia and um, Mita, who was one of our speakers, was also one of the speakers in, in, in that um, area. And, you know, what we learned from that is, you know, there's a lot of great collaborations that are going on. There's a lot of 
um, data sharing that is, you know, currently taking place, I would say, with PSTC, even with other groups that, you know, we're getting involved with. But what that comes with is, you know, we're going to start looking and gathering, hopefully, all this data, getting more data, getting people to share, you know, a lot more having uh, systems such as the BMDR system, if I'm saying that correctly. And um, really, one of the key take-home things from the um, SOT, uh, you know, I would say session was how are we going to evaluate all this data? Where are we going to store it? Where are we going to put it? You know, you really need to have, you know, very, you know, good individuals who are advanced in, in, you know, analysis of that kind of data and whether it be, you know, at PSCC helping us to be able to pull, say, that clinical data together, that non-clinical data together. Once, say, we start gathering all that information as well for, for say, say, trans byline, how, how does that all come together? And instead of developing, I would say, new tools, how do we, you know, utilize those tools that are already out there to help, you know, advance our, our use of that? And in that, you know, same respect, it's um, in generating, I would say, data sharing. It's, you know, sharing, you know, samples, sharing information, sharing, I would say, expertise and knowledge, sharing experiences with different assays, um, you know, through all the different expertise of these individuals, and it's really pulling all together. So hopefully, you know, Amita mentioned the uh, survey that was done, and that was by, um, you know, Drew Safe, and that highlighted a lot of key aspects of, you know, where this could potentially go in, in the future. So it's, you know, through PSTC, I would say, and, you know, the individuals that are involved there is how do we take that information now that's been put out there and uh, move that forward. And I think that this um, you know, session will hopefully um, you know, bring together all you know, the individuals, you know, again, and folks from PSCC and really start those conversations and understand you know, where within PSCC we can go, how can we make that and help it move forward. Um, so it, I think it'll be a great session. It was very well attended. And um, Amita, I don't know if you wanted to um, say anything as well about it. Yeah, I, ju I just want to add one statement, and I think Deidre, you mentioned it in your opening remarks at the SOT. It may sound like a cliche. You you started with saying it takes a village, and yeah, yeah, right, it's boring. Yeah, we've heard that before, but it's so true in all of the things that were discussed at this SOT meeting, as well as all of today and the continued uh, webinars that uh, we'll hear from PSTC. Yeah, I mean, no one company can do it alone, um, and it really does take involvement of, I would say, the collaborative nature of, you know, PSTC pulling that together um, in, in those collaborations, and how can we actually in, expand that, and I think some of that is, you know, what will be talked about in the, in the next, uh, Mike, John Michael, you'll probably be hitting on that, but yeah, it's how do we expand that and, you know, become more integrated with other areas as well that, you know, has are, are going to help us advance that that science and bring medicines to patients, um, you know, quicker and get them what they need. Great, thank you very much, Deidre and Amita. Yeah, it is it is great to see how how this space has expanded over the past several years, and, and companies are much more willing to share data. Um, it is, as well, another piece from from CPAP and PSTC, you'll be hearing more about the biomarker data repository. Um, over over the next probably six months or so as we, we really like to expand that initiative. John Michael, would you like to kind of finish out the, the webinar series with uh, one on more collaboration? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in January of 2022, can't believe we're talking about January 2022, but we're doing it anyway, is we're really going to talk about, you know, how uh, the CPAP portfolio has really expanded around various safety opportunities. And, and the interesting part is many of these opportunities are actually highly integrated into PSTC, but they're, they, 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 they have such a size to them that they probably need to be um, different efforts. And so some of those efforts are around the, the uh, alternative assays for the, the monkey neurovirulence test, which is a test used for attenuated vaccines, pretty timely with what's going on with uh, COVID and the pandemic. Um, you know, this is a, from, from an animal usage standpoint, it's a, it's a bit of a messy assay. It's, it's done in primates. It requires large numbers of primates. And what will be, what this, this pre-consortium has been looking at is can we bring in either in vitro models or 
um, uh, rat or mouse models to be able to answer the same question, um, but in a much better way because we know there's predictivity issues with, with that, that monkey test. Likewise, Amita mentioned this with Eliza Thompson and her activities going on around you know, acute kidney injury. You know, um, you know, we formed a working group and what we really want to do is to be able to expand um, what we've done um, with, uh, with, with our, our current uh, uh, kidney safety biomarkers, you know, number one, to have a, a larger focus on drug-induced kidney injury, but then also think about how we could utilize data from um, uh, studies where AKI is actually being treated uh, therapeutically, right? It turns out that these same drug development sponsors are using our, our kidney safety biomarkers as uh, efficacy biomarkers. And so that could be very interesting. You know, other things that we're looking at is how we uh, create uh, quantitative tools to better predict safety outcomes. And, and we can bring that into the conversation as well. And so this was a bit further off. So the nice part, it gets to evolve, um, but, but that's where we're going to go. Um, and any questions um, around this? Okay, well, we have about five minutes left, so why don't we get to the point at which we're uh, closing things down. Is that okay with you, Nick? Definitely, thank you very much. And and there was actually, uh, so there was one one post here around around data sharing um, by one of our participants um, in an article, so perhaps we'll, we'll share that following the, the, the workshop today too. Yeah, that's from Ken. Yeah, that's good to see. Thanks. Thanks for that question or that comment, Ken, and we'll definitely share that. So, um, just to wrap things up, you know, first of all, I'd like to, to thank all the uh, uh, keynotes as well as the speakers. So, Jeff, John, Amita, thank you for those uh, keynote uh, 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 presentations. Um, you know, Nick, Yuri, thanks for excellent presentations as well you know, around uh, how CPATH is evolving. And, uh, you know, special thanks to the, the panel session, uh, the panel uh, participants. I, I really appreciate your, uh, your, your points that you brought up, you know, uh, uh, Stefan, uh, Madhu, Yuri, Tanya, Deidre, uh, Nick, um, who did I forget? I feel like I forgot somebody there, Amina. Uh, but, you know, th th thanks a lot. I really appreciate that. And then most of all, I, I appreciate, you know, folks tuning in to today's workshop. You know, hopefully, you know, folks learn something. Hopefully we've motivated folks to, to, to help participate uh, within the PSTC for our mission and what we want to do. Um, um, so, so thanks everyone. And, and see you at the webinars. I, I think those are going to be a lot of fun. And I think we can, uh, and I, and I think we can uh, really do something with that over the next year. So again, happy birthday, PSTC and PSTC members. Um, any closing comments, Nick? I, I, I think just to second the thank you to all of our uh, panelists and presenters today, as well as the audience. It was great to see this many people turn out a year into um, probably what everyone has thought is a is an overabundance of webinars. So thank you everyone for for taking the time out of your day to, to participate. Great, well, thanks a lot and bye-bye everyone.